Hello and welcome to Ditch Vox, Voices in Digital Finance. I'm your host, James DiBiazio. If you enjoy the program, like, share, subscribe. My guest today is Ujwal Deep Dahal, CEO of Druk Investments and Holding, or DHI, the sovereign wealth fund of Bhutan. Many countries have agendas around national digital identity. Bhutan has actually rolled it out. It is based on blockchain, it's decentralized, it's self-sovereign, and it's at the core of what the fund and the kingdom hope to achieve in transforming this tiny mountainous country into a regional innovation hub. Ujwal Deep Dahal, welcome to Digfin Vox. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so this is going to be a fascinating conversation. You are the CEO of Druk Holding and Investments, or DHI, which is the sovereign wealth fund of Bhutan. And I think you're calling in today from Timpu. So welcome. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be a part of the Digifin podcast. So as a sovereign wealth fund, I know that we're going to talk about some of the, the cutting edge stuff that you guys have been doing around um, uh, crypto, digital identity, and, and so on. Before I get into that, just I wanted to ask you, at a, I guess on a personal note, so your background, unlike most people I would engage with at other sovereign wealth funds, um, you're a, an engineer by training, um, if I understand that correctly. And uh, you, you, know, you didn't come in from a, a career in, in, in banking or asset management. So uh, what is different about being an engineer in this role versus being a traditional finance person? Thanks. Thanks, James. And uh, good to be here. Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, I, I do think about things, but a straight answer to that is, you know, we, I, I have a lot of good people around me who advise me on some, some of the aspects of, you know, traditional financing, investments. Uh, but uh, I think being an engineer as a, as a background, I think it really helps in terms of, uh, uh, you know, I think from first principles thinking. And that's, that's one of the areas that, you know, position me to discuss talk to the talk to the expert team that i have in various other areas required for you know eventually decision making and financing uh, and and uh, investments so uh, that's a short answer but having said that i'm a, a technologist at heart uh, which also I, I which also provides uh, you know me with a perspective of looking into the future the opportunities of the future and uh, those are, I feel, some of the areas that uh, I bring on the table uh, for, for advancing the economy or the journey of 10x that we call at DHI uh, to leverage the exponential growth of technology as a, as a way of building the next generation industries in Bhutan. There's two parts, I guess, to your portfolio. Maybe you can walk me through it. I think the, the biggest part is that you're like sort of like Tamasek in Singapore. You're a giant holding company. Um, you know, you've got stakes in uh, commercial banks, energy companies, airlines, etc. Uh, and then there's also a, a piece of the business, which is uh, an investment portfolio outside of, sort of Bhutan Inc. Yes. So walk me through a little bit about, um, you know, help us describe uh, the weighting of these two sides of the business. And on the portfolio investment side, what does that look like? Um, because we're talking about from an engineering point of view or that first principles point of view, I'd be curious if that is a, par a fairly standard portfolio invested in securities, uh, you know, 60, 40 bonds, equities or whatever, or if it is um, uh, a little bit different. I, I would say it's a little bit different. Uh, the way Druk Holding Investments was formed and created in 2007, eight by a Royal Charter uh, as we, uh, you know, transitioned into a parliamentary democracy uh, and very similarly structured at Tamasak, where we operate as to pooling investments, we operate through a independent corporate governance, align ourselves very closely with the government of the day uh, in terms of strategically aligning of investments for the government uh, priorities. But at the same time, we have, a, have our independence and decision making for investments. Now, uh, there are only three strategies that we look at DHI. One is your portfolio management strategy. You know, we're managing these 24 odd companies, uh, 11, uh, 12 of them 100% owned, the rest are in different shareholding patterns. 
Um, and uh, that's the portfolio management strategy, investment, divestment potentials and, uh, and, and this stuff. The second strategy is on the investment strategy. So when I talk about investment strategy, we have uh, five specific areas of investment we look to do within Bhutan and outside. Uh, I can get into the details of five areas later, uh, but that's the investment strategy where also the international insecurities, bonds, et cetera, come into you know, uh, play for, uh, for, for the investment portfolio that we have. Uh, apart from investing in traditional industries and apart from investing in future industries. Uh, uh, in terms of percentages, I think it's very, we have a very small international investment portfolio. Uh, our, our portfolio is more in, uh, you know, in the companies that we operate and manage at this point in time. Right. Uh, the third, of course, uh, strategy we have is the innovation strategy to look at, uh, you know, building a, a innovation ecosystem for a startup economy to uh, kickstart in Bhutan. So, um, so yes, uh, I mean, uh, we manage companies uh, for corporate governance, efficiencies, investments within the companies. We also have a small investment portfolio, uh, global investment portfolio, which we intend to grow over time. Uh, and then, of course, one of uh, the other heart of the strategy is also an innovation strategy to kickstart a startup economy in Bhutan in terms of helping the next generation entrepreneurs to build the economy. Yeah. And that that last piece, um, that last piece, Ujwal, how much of that is uh, kind of a, a state-run program, even if it's a 21st century one, versus uh, a a venture style setup, or or perhaps uh, you, you know using some of your your connections or your assets to to jumpstart private sector venture. Like, wh where where is that? Where do you see this model going? Right. Um, uh, so let me let me put it this way. Maybe a quick success story. Bhutan is not known for technology development. Uh, mm -hmm. What has Bhutan done well? Uh, and I mean, two things that come to my mind is gross national happiness, a governance philosophy, and con conservation of nature. So technology is a new paradigm for Bhutan, uh, but, but we want to leverage that for uh, growing our economy 10x. Now, when I say that, uh, what we mean is at, uh, as an investment of, arm of the royal government of Bhutan, uh, we are positioning to build the innovation ecosystem. One of the major success stories, which you had a discussion with my CTO, Shark, also is on the national digital identity, mm -hmm. uh, is kind of an offshoot of this innovation ecosystem where we took a bold step, uh, you know, vision by His Majesty, actually, uh, of building a digital identity on a self-sovereign framework, which is decentralized, and having an act passed in the government and rolled out nationally, built in Bhutan with strategic partners in India and globally, but still built in Bhutan and operated in Bhutan. Of course, yeah. it's at cloud. Uh, it's, uh, it's hosted in the cloud. So that's that's one of the national product that we created, tested within DHI and portfolio companies. Mm -hmm. Now rolled out in the country, and we intend to take this product beyond the boundaries. And this is the heart of the innovation ecosystem we talk about: is to invite global innovators, startups, and academ academicians into this ecosystem to build the next generation proof of concept projects, roll it out in uh, DHI 24 companies as a proof of concept and uh, trial and test, uh, you know, market it in Bhutan and then take it global. Now, uh, so that's, that's, that's the ecosystem we are playing with. And eventually we would want to set up a independent, uh, you know, tech fund, which can support this innovation ecosystem apart from the, uh, third super lab in the world we created with uh, MIT in Bhutan, which is used as, uh, you know, the congregation place for innovators to sit together to do some of these amazing projects which can scale up beyond the boundaries. Okay. I, I sir, we, we will definitely talk in, in more depth on the national identity. I think that's uh, very interesting and important. Before I get there, though, I do want to ask you a, a hard question uh, about this idea of, of uh, going across borders, bringing people uh, to to innovate in Bhutan, um, it, my understanding of the venture world is that venture capital is is very capitalistic. Uh, mm -hmm. It's essentially uh, uh, that innovation goes hand in hand with with um, you know the financing side of it, and uh, it's pretty ruthless and, um, and it basically all geared around creating the right incentives, aligning incentives to to get institutions or or large uh, large pots of money to take chances on um, on startup type technologies through some sort of filter, which might be a VC fund. It could be something else, could be something like DHI. Um, how does that, that kind of cutthroat capitalism that you need if you're going to have a venture economy 
built as it's been built in Silicon Valley and Israel and Taiwan and in China. How do you get that? If it, how do you square that with the 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 royal goals of gross national happiness? Um, it's a different economic model, um, and I'm not trying to. I'm not. I'm not arguing that they're incompatible. I'm just. But I'm just questioning how you make the raw capitalism work with the the broader social goals in in Bhutan. I think uh, capitalism need not be ruthless. Uh, we we have championed gross national happiness. We have championed the environmental conservation, um, and and uh, I, I look at mindful capitalism in a way. Uh, so. Our thought process, if, if we are solving the right problem or running behind the right opportunity and we have the right partners, in the sense, impact investors to look at, for example, or venture philanthropy to look at, for example, uh, or even VCs with, uh, with, the, uh, with the mindful uh, you know, thought process of building what is required for the world. And we need to choose. We need to be critical. We need to be careful. Uh, we don't need the density of Silicon Valley or or any of the other innovating uh, innov you know, innovation ecosystem. A very low density is good enough to bring in a critical impact to Bhutan. So that's how I look at building innovation ecosystem to bring in the right minds. And uh, maybe this is also the right point to mention about the Gelifu Mindfulness City, which you must have heard about, uh, which is a special administrative region that Bhutan has declared. Uh, and and uh, this is a city where we, you know, where we want to bring in the uh, thought leaders and uh, in, uh, investors who, with, uh, who resonate with the values of uh, environmental conservation, who resonate with the value of uh, you know, uh, mindful living uh, in, into the future. So bringing all this together, we're really looking at a mindful capitalism to innovate in Bhutan and looking for the right investors, impact investors, uh, and venture philanthropists uh, to see how we can make this space in Bhutan as a seed of innovation to solve the right problem, but also at the same time to look at the right opportunities of the future. Yeah. One one aspect of Bhutan, which is not unique, but uh, but rare, is that you are a carbon negative country. That is, you sequester more carbon than you emit. Um, you've got vast forest reserves um, compared to the size of, of the country. Um, in other places, we're seeing people experimenting with uh, often blockchain-based uh, carbon mar voluntary carbon markets. Um, you know, what's been the experience so far in terms of trying to uh, turn your carbon footprint uh, into a, well a marketplace, an asset that can go that can conserve needs beyond just the the boundaries, the borders of Bhutan. Right. So uh, this is an interesting area for us, and this is also again one of the. Uh, one of the proof of concept projects we are working in the innovation ecosystem. And I'm actually looking for global partners to work on this project. Uh, the way we're looking at it is we're going beyond carbon assets to look at nature capital accounting. Uh, you know, so let's, what are the, what, are, what is the value of the biodiversity Bhutan has beyond the uh, trees and the carbon negativity that we uh, presently have? What are the values of the catchment areas that we have protected over decades? Um, you know, Bhutan is uh, by constitution required to have 60% forest cover. We are about 69.9% forest cover today. Um, so what are the values of uh, the glacier lakes that we have, which seems to be melting, not because uh, Bhutan has done anything wrong with this for, you know, uh, conservation, but we, we all live, live in a global uh, uh, global city at the end of the day. So uh, so our our thought process has been, what is the standard for measuring carbon or measuring natural capital account, you know, accounting? Mm -hmm. uh, how can we reassess the carbon measurement for, uh, in terms of using technology uh, and look at certifying that uh, so I can survey the cap carbon assets quickly and uh, uh, digitally uh, and also get the certification with the right standards and right bodies and use that as a way to unlock carbon financing, or should I say nature capital financing in, the in terms of uh, carbon linked bonds or, 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 or in terms of any of the other instruments that's available to be unlocked. But what's important is to really assess the digital, assess the carbon asset or the nature asset digitally and trustfully. So with our experience in NDI, digital identity, using a, a blockchain to bring in trust to the asset is also one of the areas we're looking at. And uh, this is an is area- 
-hmm. Yeah. Is that an area? Because I'm not an expert on voluntary carbon markets, but I, I see a lot of people trying things or talking about things, but I don't really see like a vibrant market that's that's having an impact. Um, it's it's is a very tiny market in in the scheme of things uh, worldwide. So you know, from using your your first principles engineering uh, mindset, uh, watch which well. Can you give me a sense of what you know? What do you see as the the roadblocks to making these markets globally uh, have have global critical mass and um, you know, are you trying to figure out ways to improve on what has already been attempted? Um, I think if, if you really drill down uh, to carbon markets, eventually what is important is to assess the uh, asset uh, and, and ensure that the asset is credible. And our focus today is to bring up standards in uh, building up a credible asset base. The right. next step, uh, so if, if, if you look at glo globally, uh, to ensure that the asset base is uh, trusted and credible, the process is just too long. And we need to use technology and digitization to lower the process of uh, you know, building a credible asset of carbon and as well as certification. It takes anywhere from uh, you know, six months to two years to get anything certified. And by that time, you would imagine what would have happened to the asset base itself. So there's a lot of ambiguity there. So there's no standards, I would say. So this is a space that can be solved. So, but again, thinking from a breaking down of uh, problems, that, that's the fundamental problem, I, 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 we feel. And in doing so, of course, we innovate a lot in the process of uh, you know, using technology to solve this problem. Uh, as simple as very quickly, you know, using LiDAR and satellite imagery to do actually carbon assessment. Uh, and, and make it a credible process that you can actually replicate every two months, uh, you know, very cheaply compared to a regular survey. Uh, so that's where I start. And then, of course, you can go all the way to certification to unlocking some of the carbon financing that's available globally. Okay. Um, and then certification is one way of saying identity. Uh, we've, we've, I've been hinting at this uh, throughout our, our, our brief chat. Uh, mm -hmm. So last year, I think you your parliament passed a law uh, around um, sort of mandating this, this national identity system that's based, uh, that you've been building. Uh, now I think uh, Polygon 2 is the, the, the base layer that you're building this on. Um, tell us a little bit about the national digital identity in Bhutan uh, and really the design decisions that you made going into this. And then let's talk about sort of the impact at the wider societal level. Um, uh, first of all, of course, this is uh, not mandatory. Uh, it is opt-in. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it so I I feel that this decentralized self-sovereign identity framework, which the world is today uh, looking at as the next step in the identity space, uh, something we have rolled out nationally is a very bold step that we have taken. But I'm what I'm proud of 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 the team that has developed of my team that has developed this. Is, um, uh, is to actually develop, roll out and operate today. And uh, we have uh, uh, you know, enrollment of about uh, 80,000 plus as we speak. So uh, about in a population. Yeah. About 10% of the population, yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, what, I mean, what's important that at the back of the, back of the thing is the technology, the, the, uh, the rollout of the uh, system is one aspect, but but how does the use case around it evolve and develop? So what, what I mean by that is I see the national digital identity as a platform for mm -hmm. credible digitalization to happen, whether it's e-commerce or whether it's identification. Once, you can, once an individual can identify 100% accurately online on the internet, you can imagine uh, you know, exponential uh, quality of service uh, that we can provide an efficient service that we can provide from banking sector to health sector to taxes to uh, border entry to anything you can imagine under the sun. Yeah. So that's how I look at national digital identity uh, in Bhutan. You've talked about using blockchain and sort of self-sovereignty decentralized. Um, why didn't you go down the route of say Adhar in India? I mean, you're a small population. It'd be probably very straight. I, I know there's a lot of migrant uh, rural people, but nonetheless, you could probably have just... Uh, Build a database that okay everybody's got their number. You can use a, a a smartphone or a feature phone to you know to, to conduct basic things or uh, get your get your government um, I don't know some sort of a pension or whatever. Uh, 
why not why not go that way i think one of the important aspects is uh, data privacy uh, for individual um, and uh, this is something we wanted to champion um, you know uh, we're also looking to develop our innovation ecosystem to find the right problems and the mindset of the next generation where people are very uh, uh, not very comfortable in terms of sharing that data uh, with anybody um, so uh, this is an ex extremely you know uh, huge example i would say that bhutan has taken across to actually use uh, let the data be used by an individual on his or her own consent uh, and that was one of the driving factors in building a self-sovereign framework, a decentralized digital identity, and not a centralized one. Of course, I have nothing uh, in, in terms of technology. The centralized one is much more mature. I, I completely agree in terms of policies, regulations. Uh, but this is a statement also, I may say, from uh, Bhutan and DHI that we are here to innovate um, and, and we look forward to having the best of minds and thought leaders uh, in, in various areas of innovation. What are the risks uh, in this system that you've tried to game out? Uh, you know, how have you thought about what could what could go wrong with this, or just or or just problems of adoption? Um, problems of uh, adoption. I think, of course, one one is the a bit of digital divide that we have, and we are you know we are we are trying to see how we can manage that because you do at this point in time you do need a smartphone for the NDI to work. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also looking at feature phones and application of NDI in feature phones. But if you look at the statistics in Bhutan, uh, you know, our internet coverage and phone coverage is well above, uh, you know, 90% and 75%. So, which is, uh, which is a good indicator that we can make this very pervasive over time. But I think the pervasiveness um, and uh, the risks are how quickly and how fast and efficiently rather we can bring up the use cases of utility of NDI. NDI, all it does actually is give you an identity on the internet. Uh, the important part of building the NDI uh, for, you know, ad ad adoption is, um, um, is, is the use case development. And we are working very closely with the banks and uh, ministries and government services uh, to hospitals, to everything else, um, so that this becomes ubiquitous as a way of identifying yourselves for any services. But that that ID also because it's 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 basically a token, right? I mean, it's something that you can build other things into that token. That ID can come with, um, you know, information about assets, medical records, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of data can be, um, you know, sort of baked into that identity. If I understand correctly, yes. So it's basically called uh, verified credentials in the world of SSI. Um, it's basically a certificate which has a, a you know, public ledger transaction authenticity for anybody to verify that this particular verified credential that an individual holding in his or her wallet when he or she is sharing uh, can be publicly verified that it has come from the individual. So the first verified credential is a foundational identity for an individual. Uh, so, uh, so basically, if uh, just to walk you through very quickly, if I want to, to uh, you know, avail a, a million neutral loan from a bank, uh, you know, instead of filling up all the papers, I can verify myself with a verified credential to the bank, uh, and give all my credential, verified credentials of my whatever other records the bank may require uh, for for me to be eligible for the loan. So if I need to share my Foundational ID as a verified credential, number one. Number two, my probably my you know uh, salary slip or or my tax paid certificate. My five verified credentials. I share it on my own terms with the bank. Uh, the bank can verify that particular verified credential that it is a legitimate one because you have a transaction in the in the blockchain, uh, and then I can I can have my loan availed. So you can imagine from that perspective, uh, all the public services could be much, much, much more easier uh, you know, going forward. Yeah. So what are some of the challenges or some of the, the timeframes that you've got in terms of making those public services able to interact with this digital ID? Um, it's, it's one thing to, to get your, your population, I'm, I'm presuming probably you're starting with your urban population uh, to use this, uh, to, to sign up. Um, but then what has to happen on the other side to get, whether it's, uh, some of the companies you own, like Bank of Bhutan or whomever it might be, uh, mm -hmm. to to then build these things so that they can, uh, you know, they can simply operate on the basis of that ID. Right. So we have uh, rigorous 
you know, because we hold 24 companies with us uh, and, and we have uh, we have mandated in a way uh, mm-hmm. through through, you know, through targets to the companies to best utilize the NDI as a platform and build use cases around it. So that's number one. Number two is um, as much as we expect the urban population to use it, we have used, uh, there is a volunteer program called Desups in Bhutan. We have about 47,000 of them uh, trained volunteers who we have used to advertise door to door in the hills and the mountains and the villages uh, to adopt NDI, uh, you know, uh, but of course on the free will, but to educate about NDI. Uh, and, and we hope uh, that many of the public services, whether it's paying your electricity bill to paying anything else, will happen through this platform eventually. Right. And as an engineer, how have you thought through the security issues? I mean, we're seeing now uh, deep fakes are becoming a, a tangible threat. Uh, they're being deployed um, uh, among other uh, more traditional uh, scary stuff in the in the cyber threat world. Um, as more and more of, of your population, your services, your companies go digital and they're you know using this ID, um, how, how do you think through um, what are the vulnerabilities and and how do you hope to uh, you know build it so that you, you don't create a problem? Right. Uh, of course, I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but uh, I do have a team of advisors when we build uh, the system. Um, of course, it's hosted in the cloud, so we are as secure as the clouds are, um, which may be the best form of security available for these applications. Um, the data uh, is not there with anybody. There's no central location of the data because it's all in our own uh, lap, uh, you know, uh, in your own smartphones, individuals' data. So, uh, uh, so if anybody wants to hack, he has to hack individuals' data, and all they get is a verified credential. There is not much information anyway, unless the whole integrated system is available. Uh, so, I, I feel that uh, that way, decentralized identity has much more, uh, you know less prone to uh, cyber attacks because there's no centralized database where, where, where you, could, uh, you could attack. It has to be individual phones or the cloud services itself. Um, so that's, that's a very high level thought process of security. But of course, um, uh, in terms of technical design and aspects, uh, right. you know, I trust the team. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, I'm not an expert on that either. So I don't, I can't, uh, I can't push it too far on that. Um, but uh, uh, walk me through the broad kind of strategy around you have, um, in addition to this digital identity that we've just spoken of, um, you've also got a um, a, a large fund uh, with BitDeer in Singapore um, that has been doing um, Bitcoin mining in Bhutan using hydropower for some time. I believe you're you're trying to scale that up. Uh, you've also been dabbling in uh, the metaverse uh, on the sandbox um, and, and and so on. So just kind of walk me through: Are these things basically just sort of test and learn uh, experimentation, and just kind of see what drops, or um, or or is there um, a more th- like you know a three five year plan, kind of a specific direction that this is going? Mm-hmm. So uh, it falls in the two strategies. Uh, of course, DHI, as I mentioned, three strategies, portfolio management, investment, and innovation strategy. The BITIA uh, partnership falls under the investment strategy uh, on the digital assets. So it's a very st- tactical move uh, investment strategy on digital asset that uh, DHI uh, delved into a couple of years ago, and we have a wonderful partner in Bitia uh, with uh, uh, and 100 megawatt of uh, uh, Bitcoin mining is operational already with Bitia, uh, bringing in a lot of technical expertise and bringing in a lot of other you know channels of revenue for Bhutan, uh, as well as uh, you know uh, transfer of knowledge in terms of managing this industry. So it's a very thought through uh, diversification of investment portfolio for DHI, which is a very small component. Look, you know, when you look at the larger uh, portfolio of DHI, uh, in terms of the metaverse, or uh, for example, the other fifteen different projects that we are doing in the innovation ecosystem, bringing in our uh, universities together in collaboration with MIT and uh, University of Sydney, for example, uh, metaverse is just one of them that we are testing. You rightly mentioned, is this a test? Uh, uh, yeah, we are doing about 15, 20 different projects uh, and trying to see which evolves to be something that we need to 
invest more on. Metaverse specifically, we call it the Bhutanverse. We launched it during the Fab 23 event last year. Uh, the Fab 23, the Fabrication uh, 23 event this year is happening in Mexico. Um, so we launched it during that time. We call it the Bhutanverse. The intent is to, uh, you know, uh, build a national gallery uh, for uh, for artists and creative people to use the digital space, to use the metaverse to express uh, creativity, uh, as well as leverage it for any, uh, uh, you know, potential businesses all the time. Are you getting users there? Because the sandbox itself, the user base, from what I can see from uh, uh, Dapp Screen and other vendors seems to be shrinking. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're only getting uh, 100 or so people a day uh, lately. So how much of that is coming to Bhutanverse? And, you know, do you just have a sense of if that, do you, do you feel that's going to take hold and be a thing? Or uh, do, do you think that you'll probably be focusing on other experiments uh, or different types of experiments uh, going forward? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, in terms of whether Sandbox as a metaverse platform will itself evolve or not, I, I really don't uh, know. My, I, I, I mean, I'm not able to, you know, see that through. But what I kind of uh, believe and know is metaverse will form a central part uh, eventually in terms of marketing and branding and many other aspects of, uh, you know, uh, aspects of operations of businesses. Uh, so that that uh, from that perspective, uh, we have built infrastructure in uh, Sandbox at this point in time, uh, pivoting, uh, readjusting our metaverse strategy uh, remains core to our uh, you know thought process and operations as we move ahead. Mm -hmm. But uh, but at this point in time, we are uh, we have a national gallery. We are uh, we have a lot of NFTs with artists displaying there. So it's kind of given a buzz in the universities in Bhutan. Uh, and and the creative people to actually digitize their assets, and then there is a national gallery to display. So that itself is a good way to motivate and bring people together in this space. For us. We are we are experimenting with a lot of technology, whether it's the you know uh, uh, sensor technology, whether it's the AI ML with all the LLMs and the regenerative AI that has you know last 15, 18 months the way it has stormed everything. We're also looking at strategically what next from LLM. I think that's also an important aspect for us to look at. Um, uh, you know, uh, so, so looking at a host of technology, but eventually applying this technology and, and building proof of concept projects within Bhutan, training with our own data uh, is, is the focus for us at this point. And uh, for example, like we, we we have trained our own national language for uh, you know uh, in terms of uh, um, in, for Zonka to English conversions, uh, and then uh, we have high level of accuracy. So we are digitizing that uh, you know uh, training the algorithms. We are also training the algorithms for traffic management in terms of our own data and and situation. And similarly, we're doing like ten different projects and putting all these, whether it's the sensor technology, whether it's AI ML, or whether it's the drone that we're using, everything into a smart city platform and framework. So, for example, so that's one of the projects we're doing. But there are a lot of innovation happening in each sphere. But we are consolidating everything towards a smart city platform. Uh, so that that has been our way forward, and we keep pivoting. We keep dropping some of the projects. For example, very quickly, one of the interesting projects we're looking at is on uh, switch reluctance motor for uh, you know for electric cars, and it's a quick a quick understanding of what happens to permanent ma magnet motors when when you have ubiquitous electric cars around the world. We, would uh, wouldn't uh, SRM be uh, so as simple as as or as complex as that to yeah. as uh, from uh, fundamental to more uh, applied research is what we do um, in the innovation ecosystem. Yeah. And could you also uh, give us a sense of to what extent any of this then returns to you and your team as as a sovereign wealth fund in terms of the way you manage the assets, the way you manage the portfolio companies, the way you think about asset allocation? Are you are these tools having an impact on on that kind of day to day? aspect of DHI? I, I would say not yet. It's just been about three and a half years that we actually started this innovation strategy at DHI. Otherwise, uh, DHI was a very traditional investment arm uh, managing the companies and looking at some of the you know in uh, traditional investment industries within Bhutan. Uh, 
Uh, but we diversified with a global portfolio of investments, a small one, of course, to begin with, and also looking at investment and innovation ecosystem. Eventually, one of the be one of the things uh, uh, that has come out is the national digital identity, which has become our twenty fourth hundred percent owned company at this point in time. Okay. Uh, but but eventually, we we hope to create more startup and companies, and it doesn't have to be hundred percent owned by DHI or if at all owned by DHI. Uh, the way I see this innovation ecosystem creating a value and uh, startup and eventually an industry, it could be it could be owned by anybody. Uh, but we, as a DHI, it is our responsibility to create this innovation ecosystem, invest in this innovation ecosystem. Today, we have about 30 young kids working in this innovation ecosystem in collaboration with MIT, setting up the super lab, collaborating with companies in drones to AI, ML, IoT globally with universities and startups globally. And we tend to see more companies coming out of it, hitting into our portfolio, but it doesn't have to be DHI portfolio. Last question for you, um, which I'll, and thanks again for, for joining me today. Uh, so for FinTech businesses around the region, around the world, whether they're in payments, banking, wealth, insure tech, uh, you know, you, you, you the, the gamut, right? Um, what, what are some areas where you think uh, they might have an opportunity uh, to, um, you know, do something with DHI or do something in Bhutan? Mm -hmm. uh, I think this will be a in very important area, especially looking at the Gelefu Mindfulness City, where we want to use uh, fintech, uh, you know, as a vertical of industries and also innovate uh, beyond the products and services that's available today, right? So, uh, again, I, I think uh, the the digital identity that we have becomes the foundation for a lot of uh, application and businesses and fintech to leverage from, I would say. Uh, so we could put that as a starting point. But uh, we are, uh, from, from Bhutan's perspective, some of the problems that we have is our interconnections with international gateways and, and, and stuff. So those are other areas that we need certain financial infrastructure to be, uh, you know, designed and implemented to be at a global standards, and we are working very closely on that. But apart from that, I think the whole platform of, you know, fintech businesses to flourish in Bhutan with agile policies and regulations, uh, with the uh, Gelefo Mindfulness City, uh, we invite a lot of fintech uh, startups and fintech innovators to be a part of the journey with us. Great. Well, I think that's a great way to end it. Um, thanks, Ujwal Deep Dahal from DHI Drill Quality Investments for joining me on Digfin Vox. Thank you, Jim, for having me.